video now. So, and then again, as I told you, I will stop it again. So I would say um, we start. So a very nice welcome, like good afternoon in case you are in Europe. If not, maybe also good morning. I'm very welcome to this uh, lecture from the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna. Um, this is organized in the framework of the Politics of Inclusion and Exclusion Working Group, which is based at the University of Vienna. And it's a lecture series, so this is one of, of uh, quite few um, lectures we have this semester from the department, which covers a range of themes. You're very welcome to check out also the other lectures at the webpage of the Department of Political Science of the University of Vienna. But now it's really um, my special pleasure to welcome Lenka Trajanova. Lenka is based at the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute, um, where she works in the framework of the Observatory of Public Attitudes to Migration. Um, so this also, you're more than welcome to check out this work, this very rich work also of the Migration Policy Center uh, on public opinion in the framework where, where Lenka is active. Um, so you can check Migration Policy Center UI um, webpage. So, and just to Lenka very briefly. So Lenka, she's an expert on public opinion, as you probably could guess by now from the title of her lecture um, about the content. Um, on political behavior and the formation of individual attitudes. So these are broadly her interests. And uh, so she, as I told you already, she works right now at the MPC, but she came um, previously, she was at the Humboldt University where she also did her PhD on tolerance and education. And I think we will also hear more about that. But I don't want to take uh, much time away from Lenka, since time is always precious, and we want to hear more about her expertise and her work in the framework of the Migration Policy Center. So Lenka, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laila, for this kind introduction. And uh, also thank you very much uh, to you and your colleagues for inviting me to be able to present my work today. So I will uh, now share, hopefully, my screen with everyone. And uh, as you, uh, as Lila already mentioned, and as you probably guessed from uh, the title of my presentation today, I uh, would like to talk a bit about early life experiences and how they actually affect our attitudes to migration. So. Uh, I am not sure uh, how much um, everyone is familiar with attitudinal research or public opinion research, so I will briefly discuss the, uh, very briefly, the, the main theories. So in, in general, we can uh, divide attitudes uh, into symbolic attitudes and material attitudes. Uh, symbolic attitudes are mostly based, uh, based on have an affective basis and uh, are more likely to be stable during our lifetime. Whereas material attitudes have a more cognitive or informational basis and uh, they are more likely to be responsive to changes over a person's life. So for example, an example of a symbolic attitude are for example, views about migration or views about gun control. Uh, which will usually be stable throughout your lifetime, whereas, for example, a material attitude would be a preference for a tax policy, uh, which might depend more on uh, where you are at your uh, life stage. So, for example, you might change your uh, preferences for tax policy if you are uh, retiring from the labor market, so we would prefer probably uh, more generous uh, pensions. Uh, and this might be different to what you were preferring when you were actively participating in the labor market. So uh, previous research uh, has established that attitudes to immigration are actually highly symbolic. So what that means is that they do not respond uh, very well to um, facts, uh, but uh, what people think about migration is mostly due to this affective basis. Um, so I will uh, discuss now a uh, few sociological slash political science theories. Uh, what we know about political orientations and attitudes 
is that they are usually stamped in, uh, into individuals during their youth. Uh, so uh, what this means is that this process of so-called political socialization um, takes place as young people adapt to their wider social and political context. So it's a kind of an a period of plasticity during a transition to adulthood uh, where people are forming their opinion. Uh, and uh, there is no universal agreement uh, when this uh, period of plasticity, uh, plasticity actually ends, but uh, usually researchers agree it's somewhere between 18 and 25 years old. And uh, we have another um, sociological theory which has uh, found a lot of support in recent years. And uh, this is the fact that political orientations are remarkably persistent. So, so those attitudes that people have formed uh, in their youth, uh, they actually persist as they uh, grow older. So, uh, and remain stable over the lifetime. So I just, uh, when we put all these pieces together, um, we, uh, in, in general, in sociology, we have actually two possible models. So if uh, one model which claims that uh, cultural beliefs or attitudes and values are actually responsive to external discourse, and uh, this would mean that people respond to changes in their local environment. Uh, but uh, if cultural beliefs are learned early in life and uh, they should be relatively uh, resilient to change. And uh, there's a nice article that came out just two days ago, I believe, um, where uh, actually uh, Basie and Kili look at uh, 500 attitudes, testing with a nice new method for these two different models. And uh, they confirm what uh, I have just presented previously that uh, mostly people acquire their attitudes and uh, then these attitudes stay un unchanged throughout their life. Um, why is this important? Uh, is also that these individual level processes underlie um, different theories of population level social change. So, uh, what I mean by this is that uh, if we want to know how a society or a country will uh, in general change, for example, their attitudes towards uh, same-sex marriage or gender equality, uh, we need to know whether individuals uh, can uh, change throughout their lifetime or not. So, so what uh, this uh, latest research shows us is that basically if uh, it's, it's much more complicated than this, but uh, if uh, we put it simply, uh, no people will not change and uh, certain generations will probably have to uh, die out for us to observe any changes in at the societal level. Uh, so here I'm at anticipating a question that I might uh, receive at the end of my talk, is, uh, which is if I'm now claiming based on uh, social science uh, research uh, that people don't change their opinions, how come we have actually seen this surge of anti-immigration parties in recent uh, years, especially in Europe and in the United States? And uh, the, the answer to this question is actually salient. So, uh, uh, what, what has happened is that uh, during the so-called migration crisis, uh, immigration was a very discussed topic in, uh, in the European media and at the political level and so on and so forth. So what this, uh, uh, this did is that people got increasingly exposed to uh, a discourse about migration, which in, uh, in turn actually, uh, let's say, activated their latent attitudes on the subject. So it's not that people became more anti-immigration, they have already been more anti-immigration before, it's just that they did not uh, consider immigration to be an important topic to inform their uh, voting decisions. So in the past, when no one was talking about immigration, uh, maybe someone was against immigration already, but uh, when uh, they went to vote, they uh, preferred to vote according to their, for example, economic preferences. So they voted voted to par for a party that they uh, thought would represent them uh, properly economically. And they did not care what this party actually stand for regarding migration because migration was just not an important issue for them. 
So today, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, things that actually affect uh, our attitudes to migration when we are still young and uh, that actually form our opinions. And um, uh, there are different socializing, uh, socializing agents uh, regarding attitudes to migration and uh, at the different contexts. So at the micro context, uh, it is our family, our friends and peers. Uh, then we also have a so-called meso context, which is usually the, our school or community and the macro context, which are country characteristics and critical historical moments. So. What you see in the figure here, take, uh, taken from one of um, a co-author publications I did, um, we, we see that some of these effects are much more uh, strong and stable, and these are on the left uh, hand side. And uh, you can think about this figure a little bit as uh, people go through life. So you are born, uh, on the left hand side and uh, what informs your attitudes, uh, in this case attitudes to migration is, uh, of course, uh, somehow your personality type, your basic human values, your moral foundations. And as you go through life, uh, what also influences your attitudes to migration is the uh, whether you went to university or not, um, uh, your parents, your, your peers, uh, your lifestyle, whether you lived in a city or in a rural area, and so on and so forth. And as we move through life, there are these um, other effects which are much weaker and unstable. And uh, these are, for example, uh, the, uh, the media influence, the politicians influence, uh, the economic competition you are facing, and so on and so forth. And uh, so a lot of what has been discussed uh, a lot in uh, in uh, the nor um, the political discourse for example is oh media uh, are influencing people's attitudes to migration because media talk negatively about migration but uh, what social science research actually shows is that uh, these influences are very weak and unstable and uh, usually they do not lead to changes in opinions regarding migration uh, you probably can think about it in your own experience. Uh, so, for example, uh, it is highly unlikely if you are anti-immigration and you are going to read one article in the newspaper being very positive about migrants and bringing such new uh, nice uh, story of success with, uh, of immigrants that you will suddenly become very pro-immigration. So this is highly unlikely. Uh, and of course, the other way around as well. So, um, so it is not as easy as uh, when uh, people just read one article and they, they would suddenly change their opinion. So today, actually, I would like to discuss uh, two, two socialization agents, which one of them is age and the other one is education. And uh, I would like to show you that it's not, again, as easy as uh, many people would think. Uh, why age and education? So we have seen uh, a lot of uh, talk about age and education in recent years, for example, also due to Brexit, when older and less educated voters uh, were said that were those that actually voted for Brexit and how uh, these characteristics have, have influenced their attitudes. So um, I will start with age uh, first. And um, basically attitudes to immigration epitomize the intergenerational political conflict. So, uh, so what we observe is that usually, uh, not always, but very often, older generations are more against migration uh, but this from a rational and uh, strictly economic point of view does not make much sense because uh, immigration is actually much more beneficial for older generations. So first of all, they have a much more secure labor market status, so they are not competing with immigrants on the labor market. Also, immigration helps the pensions and the health uh, system to become fiscally sustainable, and it is the older generations that actually profit much more from the pensions and health systems in the country. And as well uh, as the fact that immigration actually lowers prices of elderly services, such as housekeeping and caregiving, 
which uh, again all the generations profit much more so if we like, uh, look at this strictly from a materialistic or a rational point of view all the generations should be much more pro immigration than the younger generation but as i have mentioned at the very beginning attitudes to immigration are not based on materialistic and informative uh, basis but it is much a more a symbolic issue so the the big question is why do we actually observe differences in generations uh, regarding attitudes to immigration and uh, here we first have to mention what actually uh, does even age mean for us uh, because age is very often thrown into the models explaining attitudes to immigration with, without uh, considering much what does that even mean so of course age is a biological process uh, when uh, we actually change with age so why would older people uh, have different attitudes than younger people if we look at age only as a physiologic process uh, there is this argument that it's actually about the cognitive capacity of the older people. So as older people age, uh, they uh, make judgments and evaluate social, uh, social reality a little bit differently. Uh, on the other hand, we can uh, think of age more as a life cycle transitions. Uh, so basically, as you go through life, you occupy different positions in the social structure, you have changing roles and status and so on and so forth. So for example, uh, why would your attitudes change? Uh, it is that as uh, your uh, interest and perceived benefits fluctuate over the life course, then this leads to changes in your attitude to immigration as well. And uh, finally, we can think of age also as a cohort membership. Uh, what does this mean is that people born in a particular time and space actually encounter the same set of historical, cultural and political circumstances. And these shared experiences during their formative years shape their values and attitudes, which then persist uh, over the life course of the cohort membership. And uh, recent uh, studies have shown that actually, indeed, it is more about birth cohorts than anything else. It is not about a person's biological age. So it is not as we are aging that our attitudes are changing, but it is the fact that we are part of a certain generation or um, as we say, a certain birth cohort, that this influences the entire cohort's uh, individual attitudes to immigration. So uh, there, there are a few studies showing um, evidence of cohort effects across Europe. So uh, for example, uh, studies that show that generations that uh, experienced landmark immigration events when they were young have a very distinct attitudes to immigration compared to generations that did not experience these landmark effects. Um, also, other research shows that uh, cohorts that entered the labor market when the unemployment rate was high are much uh, more likely to hold more negative attitudes towards immigrants than cohorts that entered the labor market with unemployment rates uh, when unemployment rates were low. Um, uh, another evidence, for example, shows that cohorts uh, that were socialized during a strong far-right anti-immigration presence uh, have very distinct uh, anti-immigration attitudes compared to other cohorts. And uh, my contribution with my colleague, uh, Anne-Marie Janet from the University of Milano, we also point out that uh, it is possibly also the political climate of the country that might affect cohorts. So uh, if I um, go more into details is that uh, how, how we started this research is that we actually observed age cohorts that uh, came um, of age in the absence of landmark events. And they, they still have a very distinct patterns in almost all the countries. And uh, based on the fact that we know from previous research, especially by Davidov, that certain values are highly associated to attitudes to immigration, uh, we actually uh, wanted to look at the fact that it is not only about landmark events, but it's more about the political values that dominate the overall political climate. Uh, during a person's formative years that then, then affect their attitudes towards immigration later in life. 
So what we mean by political climate is uh, the dominant norms and values that prevail in the uh, in the political zeitgeist uh, reflected in the views of the political elite. And uh, we pinpoint two values specifically, and these are the values of equality and tradition. Uh, the value of equality, what we mean by that is uh, more mostly the concept of social justice and the need for fair treatment of people, also those who are different from oneself, uh, and uh, it, there is also an emphasis on the weak and vulnerable, but this is not just about migrants, but it's, for example, about LGBT rights, about uh, gender equality, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, we have a value of tradition, which uh, promotes the, the uh, maintenance of beliefs and customs, practices, culture and family, and uh, wants to avoid violation of conventional expectations and norms. Now, uh, we actually research the idea that courts that, uh, in a certain political climate might have a specific attitude to education even later in life. Um, so um, we look at contemporary data from the European Social Survey from uh, 2016. We have selected nine countries. Uh, our condition was that it needed to be a democracy, at least since 1945, because we needed fluctuation and party competition. And uh, we look at uh, approximately 115,000 individuals for 14 years, so uh, from 2002 till 2016. Uh, every two years. And uh, we had 12 cohorts, so people born between 1931 till 1990. Uh, regarding the historical data, we use the manifesto project, which actually looks at um, political uh, party manifestos from uh, 1945 to 2008. Uh, so what we did is that we looked for uh, each single year since 1945 and, uh, for of the nine countries we studied, we have looked at um, um, at the the party that was dominant or the coalition that was dominant uh, in that year, and uh, checked their party manifestos and whether they promoted more the principles of equality or uh, the principles of tradition. And um, so uh, for each generation, we have seen what political parties were promoting, what values were prevalent in the, in the political climate when a certain generation was coming of age. And uh, what we have found is actually that uh, indeed, we, what we observe is that people who came out of age uh, when the, the party that was dominant in the political climate was uh, promoting the principle of tradition are much more anti-immigrant even much more later in life. So now when, uh, uh, when this was happening, when people were uh, around 25 years old and now this generation is 60, we can still see that this entire generation even 40 years later is much more anti-immigration that uh, is a generation that uh, came of age when the principle of equality was promoted. And what we see here also on the left hand side, uh, these are actually the so-called cohort uh, random effects. And uh, we see that, uh, just to put it simply, basically for each country, you see how different generations, how much anti or pro-immigration they are. And as you can see, these effects are not much linear. So, so certain generations are actually, even older generations are more pro-immigration uh, than uh, certain younger generations. So, so it, this is, it's not always the case that the older are always much more anti-immigration and the younger are much more pro-immigration. And, and this, uh, as we show, also depends not only, of course, on the political climate that was prevalent when people were uh, coming of age, but it is also one of the factors. So um, here is the conclusion, which I have just mentioned. Um, so basically, uh, our main message from, from this research is that um, it does uh, to 
to affect generations regarding their attitudes and opinion, it actually, it does not require radical shocks on landmark events or regime change, but it's even the overall political climate matters too, actually. And uh, so the values and norms of the political climate today actually uh, inform our opinions about uh, that, that we had in the past inform our opinions about immigration today. So uh, on the other hand, also people coming of age uh, in, in these political climates with when we have Donald Trump and Brexit and the migration crisis and so on and so forth, this will affect their attitudes even 40 years from now. So I let it uh, to you whether this is positive or negative, but uh, we, we, will, we shall see that. So, um, uh, so this was the effect of age on attitudes to immigration. And now I would like to turn more to the effect of education. Uh, as Leila has mentioned at the beginning, I have uh, written a book uh, about the effect of education on where I looked more at the effect of education on tolerance, not specific. It is quite similar in the sense and uh, again, um, wh why, why there needed to be a book written about this topic. So uh, we often hear uh, people say, oh, give people education and everyone will be much more uh, tolerant, more pro-immigration, more liberal and uh, more pro-democratic and so on and so forth. And uh, so, and we, we actually can observe in some countries uh, that, that this is really the case. But uh, what I ask in this book is actually, uh, there are two important questions, I would say. One is, uh, is the effect of education really universal? So uh, what, what I mean by that is that we do indeed observe the positive effect of education on liberal attitudes uh, in the US and West Europe, but uh, do we really observe it in each country? In the world? And uh, what uh, I find, and this figure that you see now is actually from another uh, publication I did with my colleagues at the Georgetown University, uh, that uh, indeed it is not the case. So in, in many parts of the world, actually education has uh, absolutely no effect on liberal attitudes. Um, and is, as you can see also from this figure, when uh, you see the effect of education on authoritarianism. And uh, I would say uh, another very important question is, so even in the countries where we do observe this uh, effect of education, uh, why is it so? So what is it exactly about education that affects our attitudes to immigration? And uh, there are several theories uh, explaining this. So one of those, is, uh, one set are the so-called social logical theories, uh, which argue that actually education leads to better understanding of the world around us. And uh, by thinking at this in turn leads to a higher self-confidence. And uh, therefore the university educated uh, because they're much more self-confident, they don't, do not feel threatened by others or by new phenomena such as migration. And, uh, and therefore they can tolerate uh, these people or these phenomena. Uh, another, set, um, another group of theories actually argues that the reason this uh, association of education and more liberal values is that uh, education often correlates with higher social class. So uh, in this sense, the higher educated can afford to tolerate immigrants because they actually do not compete them um, with them on the labor market and they, can, uh, they do not feel economically threatened by them. And uh, the final set of theories, uh, the so-called socialization theories, um, actually argues that uh, the educational system transmit, uh, transmits uh, certain values and these uh, uh, values are reflecting of the dominant culture of the country. So based, uh, the educational institutions of democratic countries actually socialize individuals into democratic values such as tolerance or acceptance of uh, immigration. 
so to put it very bluntly, longer you are in the educational system, uh, more uh, brainwashed you become by the dominant culture because there is more time to put it into your brain. Um, so I would now uh, like to address uh, all of these theories, which is actually what I do also in my book. So uh, the, according to social psychological theories, uh, uh, we would expect that education leads to different psychological features. Of and, uh, is it so actually? And uh, I looked at this question uh, with my colleagues from Georgetown and we, use, we analyzed uh, data from the general social survey, world life survey and so on and so forth. And um, the, the very short answer is, uh, Yes, education does indeed lead to different psychological features of the higher educated. So uh, the, those that went to university are much more, uh, much less authoritarian than those that have uh, only basic education. But uh, there are several problems with this still. So what we observe, uh, one thing that we have observed is that actually it depends a lot what um, subject you studied at university. So for example, uh, those respondents that have um, uh, social science degrees uh, or what they call in the US the liberal arts majors are much less inclined towards authoritarianism than those that may or uh, STEM majors, so for example, physics. So if you have a PhD in uh, mathematics or physics, uh, you might still be a little bit more authoritarian than someone who has a bachelor degree in sociology. Uh, what is even more important in my view is that um, actually other researchers showed uh, in a panel study in Switzerland that uh, what they did they observed uh, people, I believe it, it started when they were 13 years old and they observed them uh, as they went through education. And uh, what they found uh, is that there is much greater difference between individuals rather than individual attitudes to immigration as they go through. So, uh, what this means is that people, even from 13 years old to 18 years old, uh, have not changed much their opinion. Um, to immigration, but uh, there were already quite a few differences between people. So, so uh, what this means is that actually there, what more might be going on is a process of self-selection. Same people who are already immigration are actually exactly you and go for a university degree. So there's this danger as well. And um, when we return to the group conflict theories, um, so is it a social class? Uh, and it is to the degree when economy is defined are much less uh, than people um that feel economically satisfied so differences between the different education degrees are much lower are uh, in the category when people uh, feel economically satisfied but there is some truth to that but it doesn't seem to be the main mechanism or the main reason why we observe these differences between different educational groups and uh, finally, the last set of theories, the so-called socialization theories. So um, university might be quite uh, too late, as I have already mentioned. So people that go for university usually have quite stable attitudes and uh, they might be the same ones that already had these uh, attitudes when they were 13 years old, as we have seen from the panel study in Switzerland. But uh, at a, a little bit younger age, uh, it is it seems really to be true that we are transmitted through the educational system. Um, what we might keep in mind is that uh, contrary to common belief, uh, actually there are non-democratic routes to mass education. So often people think that mass education 
uh, is something more egalitarian, which democracies promote, but uh, actually primary education or mass education can serve the goals of autocrats as well, because uh, the, they can transmit values such as loyalty, nation building, uh, or education systems. Uh, out last year actually uh, shows exactly this, that uh, actually the state control of primary school emerged a century before democratization. So what you see in this figure is that uh, many countries that were not democracies for a very long time have already established uh, primary obligatory primary education. So, so it is not a feature of democracies to promote mass education, because uh, the, the the states are very aware, very exactly of this the fact that the educational system can transmit values. Um, so what what this means is that actually education can uh, indeed lead to a more tolerant or uh, liberal attitudes uh, but uh, certain conditions mu must be fulfilled before this is the case so for example in my book i look at the length of uh, democracy in the country and what i find is that for a university uh, educated people to be more tolerant that people with basic education, uh, this can happen only in countries that have been at least uh, 40 years democratic. So countries that have still reached 40 years of democracy, uh, there are any difference in the basic education in terms of their uh, greater tolerance. So in terms of what I that uh, in the previous slide that uh, in, in countries that are promoting the official culture that which is not de democracy but is some autocratic regime, uh, of course the higher educated would probably not uh, be much more tolerant or pro-democratic. And uh, there, uh, I, I look at uh, much uh, more conditions. So here, I, this is just an, uh, an example of some other conditions. So for example, what we see on the left side that in countries that have a higher level of uh, migrant stock, again, the higher educated, uh, the difference between the higher educated and the, uh, the basic education, their attitudes to immigration is much higher. So, uh, so uh, more uh, ethnic heterogeneity leads more differences within the university education and basic education in terms of pro-immigration attitudes. And uh, we observe uh, quite a similar trend regarding GDP per capita. So again, in countries with higher GDPs per capita, uh, there is actually a bigger difference between the university educated and those with um, only basic education in their pro-immigration attitudes. So I will stop here and uh, I thank you very much for your attention and I hope there will be uh, some questions and I'm looking forward to answer them. Thanks so much, Lenka. Um, yeah, and thanks to all of you for listening. Before I give the floor to you, to all of you to ask your questions, I wanted to ask you, Lenka, to finish also this talk by three takeaways. So what are the three most important takeaways when we think about public opinion and migration also? Um, yeah, just the three most important ones according to you. Okay, so I think the, the first one would be uh, that people do not change their opinion about migration so easily as very often is portrayed uh, in the media. So the fact that the media is negative about migration does not have such an influence as very often is said to do. Um, and the, the other two takeaways, if, if we still stay within the age and education, so regarding age is actually that um, the older generations are not against migration because as they aged, uh, they changed their opinion, but it is more that they were socialized under certain conditions when they were young. 
and the the second takeaway message is that unfortunately which it's not a very positive note but education is not a universal problem solver so just giving people education will uh, might not lead to the desired outcome of people being more tolerant and liberal because there are a lot of other conditions that need to be fulfilled because this will actually happen mm -hmm. So thanks so much also for these takeaways and for this nice summary. Um, I will stop the video now. So those of you who wish, you can turn on your cameras again. I will stop it.